Hello LA232 students, as well as anyone else who may have stumbled across this video and cares to watch along. What I'll be going through is showing you how to create a base plan in Illustrator using a few other applications and websites along the way. And here is an example of one of the pieces that I would like you to upload. This is all outlined in the assignment PDF, which you can access from the class Blackboard right here. And this A2 sample deliverables, that is pretty much a really good example of what I would like you to submit. If you were to download that sample deliverables, you'll see it's a zip package. And inside of it, I've got that PDF that we were just looking at, this guy here, as well as a folder called Illustrator. And inside of this folder, there is the Illustrator file the image that is embedded inside of it, and a thumbs.db, which is just a garbage file. You can ignore that or move it to the trash. Here is what that Illustrator file looks like. And I've got my layers open. You can see each one of these components lives in its own layer. And that doesn't happen magically. You have to set that up. I'll be showing you how to do that. I've got a couple wire-framed pieces down here. and. You know what? I've also got my workspace set to Essentials if you would like to follow along. If your layers are not showing, you can access those by hitting F7 on your keyboard or going to Window and then selecting Layers here. Once you've got this set up, it's fairly easy to create this. This is a Save As option. And this is actually a very lightweight, high-quality image. It will print very nicely on a color printer, 11 by 17. And the file size itself is less than one megabyte in size. So that's pretty nice. So which site would you want to turn into a base map? The process I'll show you really works for anything. But if you are a student of mine, I would like you to download this 232 assignments to sites.kmz. And once that is downloaded, it will open up in Google Earth. You want to have Google Earth. If you do not, just download the free version for now. If you'd like the Earth Pro, sign up for my fall class, which is a GIS course, and I can hook you up with that. But if you open this KMZ in Google Earth Normal, you will see that it has various sites along with some pop-up information and a name. The name corresponds to you. That is the site I want you to work with. And everyone has a slightly different sized shape site, which is going to require slightly different thought to lay out in your Illustrator document. Because as a part of the assignment, I want you to determine what is the most appropriate scale to fit this size. And if you have a really wide image, you may want to change the orientation. How do you do that? You can start with that orientation. If I go File, New, set this to Tabloid. Don't worry too much about the bleed or the color mode right now. But here's where I can set the orientation. And if you don't like this orientation, you can change it by going to Document Setup, Edit Artboards, and clicking right here here. Hitting escape will boot you out. And there we go. What I'd recommend is that you save this early and save it to a very specific location. The name of the folder doesn't really matter as much as the relative location of the pieces that you will be putting into it. Now, I'll do my best to reproduce that example file that I just showed you. It won't be exactly the same, but it'll be pretty close. And use the defaults for whatever version of Illustrator you have. I'm using the most current version or the Creative Cloud. You might have six or some flavor of that. This should actually work for four or five or six. If there are any issues, just go ahead and send me an email and I'll do my best to clarify. So this file is now inside of this folder right here. And this is important because any assets that I'm going to place in here, 
I'm going to put in this folder before I place them. That way the links will be maintained. I'll explain more about that in a little while. Let's jump back to Google Earth and I'll explain what these colors mean. The color is the portion of the site that I want you to include in your base map. And you could just take a screenshot of this. You could save this image, but if you've only got the normal version, the resolution will not be appropriate for print. If you do have access to the pro version, you might get print quality resolution, but there are some weird rights usage issues that you need to be aware of, and it's not a part of the process that I'm going to show you. I'll be showing you how to get these from the USGS Earth Explorer site. And that is what that pop-up is for. This address, it's really just to help us locate this in one of these early steps. So if you find your site in the places list, open up that pop-up and copy that address. And I'll explain in a moment why I'd like you to do that. Also, you might want to keep this view somewhat close by because you're going to need to recreate this outline in order to access the images that you need. All right, let's hop over to the earthexplorer.usgs.gov, an excellent, excellent website to get all kinds of really good base plan information and data. If you do not have a USGS account, I recommend signing up for one. It is free and it'll work for all kinds of government data sites that you'll probably want to access. And go ahead, pause, sign up your account. I'll be here waiting when you come back. And once you are back, you will want to paste that address that I've included conveniently for you on that Google Earth file and click show. It should give you a location. Now, this USGS site is a little goofy. Whoops, I don't want to do that. Notice how I dragged my place finder. That's bad. So I'm going to repaste that, re-click this, and I'll zoom in this way. I'll just click the little thing here. Mine doesn't get us exactly in the right spot, but that's okay. Now what you want to do is just get in the right neighborhood. These addresses aren't exactly in the center of your respective sites. They just allow you to get kind of close. And once you are close, you can X out that place mark that was discovered and start clicking around your site to try to match what I've created for you in this Google Earth file. So this one comes over to the river up to 15th and I'm just clicking. It doesn't need to be perfect. I'll explain what is happening here in a moment. This is defining the area that we want the Earth Explorer to search for and around to find our aerial images. And once you've defined this area, you can click over to the next tab, this data sets. And this is all the great stuff you can access and download from the Earth Explorer website. If you expand any one of these, you'll see that there's even more information. And if you're not sure what they are, or it's a blizzard day and you're really bored, you can click the little I and you will be taken to a website explaining what that data is, where its source is, how it can be used. Again, if you really want to learn more about this, sign up for my GIS course. But what we want to access is this high resolution ortho imagery. And if I click here, the additional criteria tab now becomes active. So what I want you to specify here is the resolution. Just click on one feet. You can access 0.5 feet. And what this means is every pixel is equivalent to that many units. So it's one pixel resolution. That would be six inch resolution, which for base plan information isn't too bad. I'll click on results. The website thinks, and hopefully you'll see, hopefully no more than a couple pages of results. And I'll explain what is happening here. The first one, the footprint, it quickly highlights the area that that data covers. And you can see here, it's 
overlapping my defined area a little bit. I'll click this one. I'll click all of them. So I would think for this one, the majority of my site, now you might get really lucky on the sites that I've defined for you. You might just happen to find one that's right in the center of one of these panels. You might still want to follow through with this exercise for the sake of doing it, but more likely than not, you're going to have to assemble these in Photoshop. And I'll explain that in a moment. But if it is really close, and you want to be careful with Chrome because it sometimes zooms when you don't want it to. I'll fix that. If it is really close like it is on this east edge of the site I've defined, you know what, that's okay. It, most of what I need is included on these two left images. So I'm going to turn those two off. And it's nice that they're color coded because you can quickly visually see which ones you want. Once you are signed in, you can download those by clicking this little green download options button. I must be logged in. Well, I sure thought I was logged in. Well, that's no good. Log in. The universe does not want me to create this video, but I'm going to fight to the universe until it is complete. All right, now this is what I expected to see. You get a little pop-up window that explains what is happening. I will download that one and I will download the other one. These files are quite large. They're about 17 to 25 megabytes a piece. If I did the six inch resolution, they would even be larger. So go ahead and just download these. The one foot resolution should be okay. Hopefully you don't have more than four. I guess you might end up with six depending on the size of your site, but that's all right. More practice for you. Once your files are downloaded, you will see two kind of strangely named zipped packages. And if you open these up, it might be a little bit confusing and intimidating, but don't be. I'll try to explain what's going on here. Each one of these downloaded zipped files contain a folder called 2008. And there's another folder and there's another folder. And if you keep digging into volume, you will find your TIFF eventually, and you'll also see a .tfw. That is a world file that allows this image to be geo-referenced. That is outside the scope of this class, so you can ignore those for the moment. I'm going to open that one up into Photoshop, and I'm going to go back here and open up that other one. The really cool thing about GIS is that if you had a GIS application, these would magically show up in the correct position. And there are even Photoshop extensions that will allow you to do that. There are some really cool things from a company called Avenza. And you know what? Let's go and hop over to Avenza. I'll give them a little plug. If you really get into GIS, they kind of do some fun stuff that will turns Photoshop and Illustrator into GIS type applications, but we're not getting into that. All right, so here is my site here, and here is the top piece. I need to stitch these together. Here's what I would do. And you know what? Let me back up a little bit. I could just dump both of these into the Illustrator file and do the aligning and the masking here, but it's a little inefficient because I've got two 25 megabyte files that would be linked to this, and it's more than what I need for the moment. If you want to do it, you sure can. But for this assignment, I'd like you to follow along with what I'll be showing you. Back in Photoshop, I'll grab my crop tool because I know I need to add this on top of this image here. So I'll just make this bigger, you know, but like that looks good, and hit return to register that. On this one, I'm going to drag this off to the side. I'll hit F7 to bring up my layers, which are hiding back here. 
Why did I do that? Well, because I want to, with this one in the focus, I'm going to drag this layer over here and it will magically show up. Now, because I downloaded these from a site that has a very specific and known resolution, I know these will align perfectly. I also know what the size is. Let me jump back to this other one. If I were to go to image and image size, I would see that the pixel resolution is 2029 or 2929 by 2958. Well, what's the size of this? It is 2929 feet by 2958 feet. How do I know that? Well, because I know the source told me that and I specified it when I downloaded it. Let's take a look, just in case you forgot. Earth Explorer, additional criteria. I set my resolution to one feet. Not all of these are available. A lot of this is trial and error. You just need to come in here, see if you got it. When in doubt, do all. And it will modify your results. And you'll see why I didn't want to do that right now is because there's more choices than I really care what to do with. So let's move this up to the side. Back to Photoshop. I need to get this cropped down to a more reasonable size. Now, here's what a lot of you, I am sure, have done in the past or might be told to do, and this is wrong, or it's, it's inefficient. You might come in here and change your opacity and try to get down and zoom in and align this up. Well, that works, but it's kind of tricky to get it perfect. Let me put that back to 100. You might use this tool called Photo Merge. That works really well if you have a bunch of images from a still camera or maybe a high number of files from different sources that you need to align or from even different times. If I had different aerial photographs from different years, this tool uses an algorithm to align them as well as it can. But pixel for pixel, these will align perfectly. If you know that, I recommend you use difference. What is difference? It is essentially pixel math. And we're saying if a pixel is 100% identical, it will show up as black. If it is 100% different, it will show up as white. Because these pixel for pixel will align, I can use the difference layer mode and get in here really close. I'll zoom in some more. And now I can even use my arrow keys and just nudge this until everything is black. When you see black, you know that everything is aligned. Now I'm holding down the Alt key with the zoom tool to zoom out. Oh, it's not black down here. Well, it's close enough. If you zoom in, that shows you a higher level of detail. So I'll trust that view there. Don't forget to set this back to normal. And at this point, you might want to return to your Google Earth file. Do a quick visual analysis because I want you to at least show the extents of this and not a whole lot more. So I don't want you to map an area this big because it includes your site. I want you to go in here and get this to a reasonably efficient size real world representative size. So back here, I can take my crop tool and I'm going to crop to as close as I can the area that was designated in the Google Earth file. That looks good. Hit return to register. And I can also flatten the image. I don't need to do that, but it sure doesn't hurt. Flatten the image. And you know what, while I'm here, let me go to my image size and I can see that this pixel resolution is 1661 by 1526, which corresponds to feet. The resolution here does not matter. All that matters is the pixels across and the pixels up and down. You know what, I'm going to write that down because I might need to come back to that in a moment, 1661, okay. And I'm going to save this as a TIFF. Very important, don't check layers. If you flattened it on that previous step, that'll be fine. TIFF is a format 
that you can have layers, but it will increase the file size and it is unnecessary for this assignment. Here's the other super duper important part. I want you to put this in the same directory that your Illustrator file is saved as. Let's call this one the Zagel. Hit save, you will see this dialog. The different types of compression, I'll explain more about those later, but LZW is good. That is what's called a lossless compression, meaning the image file is reduced when it is saved, but the quality is not degraded. So take a look at my document size in the lower left-hand corner. It's probably really small and hiding behind some YouTube stuff, but it says 7.25 megabytes. I'm going to activate LZW compression, save this, and take a peek over here. Let's do a git info. And that is 5.3 megabytes. You know what, that's not the best compression, but it, it's not bad. And you know what, while I'm here, you don't need to do this, but I'm going to save this with JPEG compression. And I've got a little warning saying, yeah, be careful. And I'm really gonna dial this down to a medium quality. Come back here, get info. Oh, 393 kilobytes, that's awesome, isn't it? Well, kind of, but it's also going to compress this and decompress it every time I open and close it. So that is good as a last step when you know you're not going to be modifying that image anymore. Just wanted to show that as an example. For Photoshop, we're really done. I don't think we're going to need this anymore. I'll keep it open just in case. And I'm going to scoot on over to Illustrator because now is kind of the fun part if you love math. If you don't love math, hmm, I guess you're just gonna need to kind of trudge through this. I'm going to go File, Place, and select that image. The size does not really matter. Just go ahead and place it. And with your select tool, hold down shift first, grab a corner that will maintain the aspect ratio and prevent this. That would be bad. You don't want to do that. I'm going to undo. Just get it close. Here's how I would recommend doing this. Get it kind of close to what you think it might look like. And at this point, you might decide that you want your orientation to be something other than portrait. Quick review, you can click document setup, go to edit artboards and change that right here. I do not want to do that, so I'll change it back and hit escape. All right, now the math part. If you highlight this, you should see in the upper corner, upper right hand corner, the height and width. The X and Y has to do with the position. And this little nine square grid has to do with the position as well. Notice I've got the upper left hand box selected. I'll check the center one, I think that's the default. And I'm going to set my X and Y to zero. Notice it sets that point, that registration point to that same corner. If I click that upper left corner here and do the same thing, zero, zero, I can see that it places it there. So that has to do with positioning. I am more concerned with the height and width. And I can see that this is 9.652 inches wide and 8.86 inches in height. Well, that means my scale is one, oh, what would my scale be? Because I know this thing is, oh yeah, that's right. That's why I wrote that number down. Remember that? 16. 1661. Let me make this bigger. I'm just typing on here for your benefit. You don't actually need to do this for your Illustrator file. My scale is 16.61 feet equals, I already forgot, 9.52 something inches. Well, that is an extremely unconventional scale. You would never want to put this on here. You typically, for plans, want to use an engineering scale, which is this guy, or a scale that 
can be read with an engineer scale. It's this triangular contraption you may or may not have seen, and it's usually 10 through 60. Now, you might have one of these. This is an architect scale. Conventionally, this is used more for detail drawings and when you really need to get in and find out what the chamfer is on a soffit or what have you. Plans conventionally in the world of landscape architecture are drawn out with what's called an engineer scale and typically the convention is one inch equals something. It's usually like one inch equals 100 feet or 500 feet or 600 feet. It's very rarely an odd number or a, a half 100, like 550 feet. And most definitely don't ever do something like this. I see a, a lot of people do this. Bad idea because you can't really measure it. Don't even put a scale on it if that's gonna be the issue because sometimes these are gonna get printed out and attempted to be measured. Um, another type of scale, now this is called a unit scale. One unit equals another unit. Another common type, especially in the GIS world, is a map scale. And you'll see it like this, where it's separated by a colon. And what this means is one unit on this piece of paper equals 20,000 of that same unit in the real world. More of a GIS convention. Either one of these will work, the engineering scale or the GIS one for this assignment. Let's go ahead and get rid of those because we need to find out how do we get to that scale. You know what, I'm gonna bring those back because I might actually need them. Well, we could take this and figure out what one inch equals, but that's what I recommend. First, try to figure out what your map equals. What is one inch equal to? And here's an even easier way to do this because that gets a little confusing. Change the size of your map to have the width be 10 inches. And, whoops, oh, I did something bad there. I'm going to undo. Make sure you've got this constraint width and height checked. That's really important because otherwise you will accidentally distort this and that would be bad. I'm going to set my width to 10 inches. All right, so the width of this is 10 inches. Now I know that 10 inches equals 1,161 feet or some easy math here, one inch equals 161 or 166.1 feet. Well, that tells me I'm in the ballpark, but something between one inch equals 100 feet and one inch equals 200 feet would work well. So how do we scale this up? Well, you always wanna think about what you're going from and to in terms of the real world measurement, not the paper measurement, but the real world. If I want to go from 166.1 to 100, all I need to do is divide it, the from by the two. And the math is actually quite easier on here. It's 166.1%, but you know what? Since I got the calculator open, let's do it anyway. Let's clear that 166.1 divided by 100. Oh, what a surprise, 1.661. Well, in terms of percent, that's 166.1%. How do you scale this? It's kind of, once you find it, you'll come back here often. Object, transform, and select scale. Also important that you make sure you've got the element that you want to scale selected ahead of time. And I'm going to scale this 166.1. Percent. Notice it's not 1.661%, it's 166.1%. Hit OK. Oh, well, that's obviously too big, but I now know with certainty that this is one inch equals 100 feet. It never hurts to come back and verify this from time to time. And how could you verify this? Well, you can grab the measure tool, which is hiding underneath the eyedropper tool. If you click and hold, you can activate that. And I will click, oh, how about this corner to that corner up here? Click and drag. This dialog will open up. Take a look at the D, the, that's the distance. Don't worry about the height and width or the angles. 
So my distance is 18.42 inches or 185, 184 feet. How can you verify that? Well, you either just need to know it or you can hop over to something like Google Earth. And I'm going to turn this off. I measured from this corner to this corner. Hey, look at that. There is a show ruler. I've done this project in the past and I've used football fields because hopefully everyone knows what a football field is. But in this assignment, you're gonna to have to do it this way. If I measure from that corner to that corner, I can see that it is lots of centimeters. I sure don't want centimeters. I want, I don't want inches either. Feet, 186 feet. Close enough to confirm that my scale is correct. But unfortunately, that one is not going to work here. The nice thing about getting this far though, it's the math is pretty easy to change it to one of these conventional scales that would could be measured with this thing here, this scale. And here's how it works. You know, if it's 10, you can conventionally and very logically do one inch equals 10 feet, one inch equals 100 feet, one inch equals 1000 feet. All three of those work very well. And you can apply that same convention all the way down. But if you had something like one inch equals 550 feet, that scale is not going to be helpful. That scale is not going to be helpful. And uh, generally, it's not going to be very helpful. But I know that this is one inch equals 100 feet. So I can go back to object. Oh, transformers grayed out. Why is that? I don't know. But uh, uh, is now not grayed out. Transform scale. And this always keeps the last value you had typed into it. It's relative to whatever you have selected. So if I hit OK, it would scale it again. It's not telling me that that had been scaled. Just know, just to kind of ignore whatever number is in here. But do know, now if I scale this by 50%, that will now equal 1 inch equals 200 feet. Well, that's almost a little too far on the other side because Oh, that's a little far. If you type control double quote on your keyboard, it will bring up your grid. Mine are set to two inches. I'm also going to do control R. Oh, one inch. Yep. So each one of those squares, the big squares is one inch. As a part of this assignment, you cannot have a margin greater than an inch. So I'm going to need to get creative here. I'm going to just hit those same keyboard shortcuts to undo that. Well, I can't really do 150 because, you know, I would not like that. So what can I do? I could start thinking about if centimeters, or not centimeters, meters, maybe meters would be better. Um, maybe I'd want to consider a GIS scale, one colon number. Or if you remember this one, I did yards. I'm a golfer. It's a golf course. Yards are very conventional. So that will work for this. Well, okay, now we need to figure this out a little bit. I'm going to go back to one inch equals 100, just because the math is a little bit easier. There are three feet in a yard, right? So that means that this scale is one inch equals 33.33333 yards right? Well, if I want this to equal one inch equals, oh, 50 yards. Remember, you divide from what it's at, the from to the two. Let's go back to the calculator because this time I'll need it. 33.33333 divided by 50 equals 0.66666. That's the scale I now want to transform this by. 0.66666, and that is incorrect because it's not 0.666, it's 66.66666. All right, so now I am at one inch equals 50 feet. Pretty close, and honestly, it'd probably be okay. This would even make a nice bleed. A bleed is just when an image goes all the way to the edge. When I export this, anything outside of that artboard would not come along for the ride. But you know what? I want a little bit of a border on this one. Personally, if you want to do a bleed and it's close like this, go for it. Now I am at one inch equals 50 yards. I want to try one inch equals 60 yards. Well, calculator again. I'm going from 50 
divided by 60, 8.3 or 83.33333. Highlight the object, transform, scale, and 83.33333. All right, that looks about right, or pretty close for this example. If I bring my grid back up, you know, I'm within an inch, not too big of a border. And I know that this equals 60 yards. And I'm just typing these numbers down here kind of for my mental benefit to keep tabs of where I am at. All right, so I've got my scale done. Now it's just a matter of cleaning up the rest of the file. It should be pretty easy to do. I'll come back and do my layers in a moment. But there's a couple other tools I'd like to talk about. One is the alignment tool. On this top bar, you should have, or you should see, these alignment tools. Those are good for quick alignments, but something else really good to know. So I just went to align, oh, I'm sorry, window and align. That brings up this toolbar here. You can close these other ones. You can drag these off if you don't want to worry about transform or pathfinder and close that. Hiding underneath of this flyout button is a show options and down here, I've got the option to align to the selection or align to artboard. If I wanted to align these two objects relative to one another, I would use align to selection. Now I can select both of those. With both of them selected, I'm going to click on the text. Notice it kind of highlights itself. So that is saying that is what I'm aligning around. Now if I hit this button here, align horizontal center, it aligns the top to the bottom irrespective of the artboard. So that was just an example. I'm going to set this back to align to artboard. Only click, I'm gonna click off in space here to deselect first. Only select my aerial photo and click on the align tool. Because I have align to artboard, it aligns relative to the artboard. Now the up and down, you might just need to manually kind of eye it. Now that I really messed that up, I'll go back here. Here's kind of a fun trick. If you hold on shift before you start to move, it will lock it. Oh, that got messed up. Let's try that again. I'm going to start moving it first, then hold down shift. And that allows you to lock it in set directions, either 45 degree angles or up and down, because I'm just trying to eye it to get the height to be about the space up here, about the same as the width. All right, that looks pretty good. I don't need this text anymore, get rid of that. And you know what, now's a good time to create a layer by clicking this little piece of paper icon. And I'll call that Aerial Photo. How do I get this into there? This, is a, this will be worth the price of watching this video. Highlight that object and in your layers panel, you'll see this little color square over here. You can click that, drag it, and let it go. Now it is in its own layer. And if I don't want to mess it up, I can click the square next to the eyeball. Now it is locked. So that's set in place. I don't need to worry about it. Oh, and I just saw some remnant things on there. I'll hit delete because I do not want those. Okay, what's next? Well, I want you to give this thing a title. So. You can hop back to your Google Earth. I kind of arbitrarily named these. Feel free to use these names. That's perfectly fine. Or give it something a little bit more specific if you happen to know what it is. I'm going to click with the text tool down here. I'll type L Zagel Golf Course. Let's zoom in on that. Now, I want to talk a moment about styling. There's styles and there's styling. I could change the size on this, make it bold, do everything I need to do right here. Not the best habit. Get used to using styles. Styles are applied or applicable in nearly every application, whether it's Microsoft Word or Photoshop or Illustrator or AutoCAD. And rather than tell something that it is bold and courier font and italic and and purple you would say this style is those things and this text is assigned to that style easier to explain 
or to show than it is to explain. So my next line here, Fargo. And I want to put the longitude, if I can spell it, long longitude and the latitude. So as modern as Illustrator is, there is still not a spell check, which is really fun. It always means you got to get used to going into something like a notepad or text editor or Word for that matter, pasting it if your paste works, which mine does not. There we go. And then running your spell check. Yay, no red lines. That means I, I know how to spell. Don't say that. All right, we'll come back and fill those in in a moment. And oh, what was the other one I had in my sample file? Oh yeah, the photo. Photo taken. Okay, how do we find those last three elements? I'm, I'm making you do a little bit of scavenger hunting, but valuable stuff to know. And this is kind of related to having a graphic and written scale. That will allow this image to be accurately measured regardless of who it gets passed to and from. This will allow this location to be accurately discovered regardless of if people don't know where Fargo where North Dakota happens to be. So it's a little bit of insurance on this file. And I'm going to go back to Google Earth. Let's clear that measurement. Let's turn these back on. Here's a neat way to find latitude and longitude. Grab a place mark, which is this little push pin tool up here. Place it somewhere in the center of your site. And on the Get Info dialog that pop up, pops up, you will see this. Now my latitude and longitude are set to degrees, minutes, seconds. You know, if you want to use those, those are fine. I'm kind of a fan of decimal degrees. I'm going to go Google Earth Preferences. Windows users, you got to go over here. I think it's under Window or Options. Your preferences are in a different location. But once you open this up or discover it, I'm going to do decimal degrees. Again, you can do the degrees, minutes, seconds, if you so like to. I will copy that back to Illustrator. I believe that was my latitude, and I gotta make sure my cursor is inside of here. Copy that. I'm just using the shortcut keys to copy. All right, those are there, and I think I accidentally created some extra junk. Like that guy I'm gonna get rid of. All right, so, oh yeah, the photo taken. How do you know when this photo was taken? Well, hopefully you still got the Earth Explorer website open because when we downloaded these, it very conveniently gave us the acquisition date, and this happens to be the 3rd of May, 2008. May 3, 2008. All right, now let's style this. I'm going to zoom out just a little bit. I want this to be somewhat appropriate for the size of this paper. And again, I could just go in here and change the settings up here, but I want to introduce you to this notion of character styles. So window type character styles, you will see this dialog. And how it works is you can set the text. So I'm gonna go ahead and say, I want this to be, oh, how about 28 points? and I want it to be bold. You may or may not have the same fonts that I've got. Just choose some, use your discretion, something that is readable, not too fancy. All right, that looks good. And when it looks like what you want it, on this character styles dialog, hit the fly out, create a new character style, and give it a logical name. So I'll say, oh, site name. Now I can apply this on any other maps that I might be creating. Now for these ones, let's see here. I'm going to make that 15 and, oh, you know what? Why not italicize it just for something different? I'll keep the color black and I'll do this again. New character style, call it. 
site location. These just need to be named logically enough that they make sense to you or anyone else you might be working with. These details, I want to make these gray. So I'll click on this color drop down over here. You can also click on your foreground color on your toolbar over here or your fill color. Hmm, that looks all right. And I'm going to make these, oh, call this details. All right, now this really works well too. Just what's more important here is that I'm introducing you to this concept of character styles because you're honestly probably not going to be applying these to too many things, but if you were working on a really large document, you would probably want all of your headings to be one, all of your subheadings, all your paragraphs, your block quotes, etc., set to a certain type. All right, well, let's say, you know, I want oh, that to be a hair smaller, so I'm going to highlight that text, change this to 26, and I'll hit enter. It changes, and if I click on my site name again. Now it has a little plus on it. Notice that little plus. So that's telling you that this particular text had, it's a slightly modified version of the character style. It's basically saying, hey, it was given the style, but you've modified it a little bit. Hey, just FYI, be careful. If I wanted to redefine that character style, and in fact, you know, let's do it this way. Let me let me go over here and make a couple copies. Imagine you got these spread all over your document. And I hope this works. I'm kind of winging it here. I want to redefine that. You know what? I'll do this too. Let's go back up to 32. All right, so I got that size set to 32. I've got it highlighted. This plus is telling me, hey, this is what it was assigned, but it's slightly modified. On this flyout list, I can select redefine character style. They should all change. Oh, they don't. Okay, well, let's see here. There we go. But if I were to click on those, click on the character name, they update. There's a way to get them all to manually update. I'll have to come back to that because I wasn't really planning on showing that part, but let's get rid of that, get rid of that, and get rid of that. All right, so what else do I want to do? I think these would look better aligned right. Now I can revisit my alignment tool. So here's an example of where I want this file and this file to be aligned. I can't select that base map because it is locked, so I'll unlock it. Select both of those, hit the align right. Oops, why did it do that? Undo, because I've got my align to set to align to artboard. I want to align to selection. Click on that. There you go. Now I maybe just move that up. You may or may not see these little green lines popping around. That little green line on the side there. If you do not see it, that's called a smart guide. And you can turn it on and off by doing a control U or command U if you're on a Mac. You don't see anything change. I just hit command U, but now that line went away. If I do it again, command U, now it will, will return. And it's a little inferencing tool to help you align things. So I'll get this kind of close. On these, I don't want your gaps to be too large in between elements. And I like when things are aligned. Generally, people like when things are aligned because things that are aligned are tended to be seen as related. And it's also nice. I don't know if it's feng shui, but I like things to be aligned. All right, what else do we need? A scale, that would be nice. So how do we do a scale? I'll grab my text tool. Scale, what is this one? Well, I happen to know it's one inch equals 60 yards. Now, I just want you to apply styling to this part, but these other things, you know, I'd like you to demonstrate that you understand styling. These other parts, you can use your discretion and scale, modify the old fashioned way. You know what? Since I'm here, I want to show you, remember I was talking about the uh, different scale types? Let's do a map scale, just for the fun of it. For the fun of it. If this is one inch equals 60 yards, and you want to figure out what would be an appropriate map scale, which is one unit equals some other units in the real world, 
one inch here equals that same amount of units in the real world. You gotta bust out your calculator again. So here's my calculator. 60 yards oh, times three is 180 feet times 12 is 2160. So if I was in a hurry, I would say one colon 2160. It's a little unconventional, but honestly not as unconventional as saying one inch equals 525.3 feet. But generally, big whole numbers work better here. So I would say this would make more sense if it was one colon 2000, and it's pretty close. So how do we figure out the math on that? Well, just remember, from two. I wanna go from 2160 to 2000, so 2160, divided by 2000 equals 1.08 or 108%. Back to my map, object, transform, scale, 108, and hit okay. There we go, that actually works pretty good. You know, for this example, in the example I have on the website, I'm using this convention. For the video, I'm gonna stick with this. I kinda like that. 1 to 2,000. I guess it is going to kind of muck up my uh, my graphic scale here. How would I do that? Well, we can figure it out. But scale, 1 to 2,000. I need to kind of move these to get that alignment factor good. As I mentioned, always good to have a graphic scale as well as a written scale. Here's how I like to create those. Grab the rectangle tool, just draw a rectangle, and up here, give it one inch width. Uncheck the constraint. You know, I like to go 0.15. I kinda like this to be the size. You know what, just to be different, I'll do 0.25. I'm all for variety. So that gives me a one inch by 0.25 inch little square here. This makes more sense if I would've stuck with my one inch equals uh, some units type scale, but you know, I'll stick with it here. See what happens now with the move tool or the select tool If you hold down the alt key before you start to drag you will create a copy So that's kind of nice. I'll do it again holding down alt drag a copy Now I can not holding down alt and I'm using that inferencing to get me kind of in the ballpark here and if I wanted this to be the same, well, I'd have to kind of figure out, this is where imperial units kind of fall apart. I would say one inch, or let's see here, one inch equals 2,000, 2,000, I would need to go 2,000 divided by 12. One inch equals 166 point, some really crazy number of feet. So conventionally, if I was following this, Yeesh, I would probably do it that way. But you know what? We'll kind of wing it here. I want to figure out how big of a shape do I need on my piece of paper to give me some logical number. Maybe I want these squares to represent a whole number like 100. Well, what would I need to do? I would say 100 times 12, oops, that's not right. What I would actually want to do is these units would no longer represent an inch. They would be catered more for a logical number like 200. Well, I know because I just did the math, one inch equals 166 point some weird number, right? 2000 divided by 12, yeah, 166, six repeating. So. I wanna say, well, that should really equal one inch equals 200 feet. Well, how do I do that? I need to go 200 divided by 166.66666 equals this. So 1.2 inches is how big these need to be. If you need further clarification, phone up your eighth grade algebra teacher. So I'll change the width of that to 1.2 inches. Delete those, select that, hold on Alt, make a copy, 
make a copy. And then I'll type a number. I'm going to say 200. I'm going to highlight that, make it something like 12. And I'll move it right down here. And while I'm here, I'll change the color. Hold on Alt, make a copy down here. 400. Hold on Alt, make a copy up here. 600. So here's a trade-off. If you want to use a map scale, it's going to be easier to figure out how to get this to fit on a nice scale that's appropriate for your sheet of paper, but you're going to have a harder time figuring out your scale. Graphic scale. If you do it the other way around, you might be a little bit trickier to get this to fit, but your graphic scale will be much easier. Again, just email me if it's really confusing. Once you've done it a few hundred times, it makes perfect sense. All right, the last thing we will need to add here, or one of the last things, is a north arrow. And I want to introduce you to the Pathfinder tools. Window Pathfinder. That tool looks like this. As with most of these tools, there's an options option. Oops, I thought that would bring up something down here. It doesn't, not like the align. So just ignore that. But the Pathfinder tool is Illustrator's take on Boolean operations, which is adding and subtracting or dividing or intersecting. Everyone calls them something different, but they're essentially Boolean operations. I don't know why they can't. I'll just call them Boolean operations, but that's what we want to use. So I'll just keep this over here. And this is more of just a follow along. So got my ellipse tool, which is also the circle tool. If you click and drag, you can create a circle or an oval. If you hold on shift, it will keep it to a nice circle. And if you hold on alt, all at the same time, you can go about center. But all I really care is that you get a circle. So however you can create a circle, go for it. Now I'll click on that tool. I'm going to draw two rectangles. Actually, I'm going to draw one rectangle and I'll make a copy. Highlight, hold on alt, drag down here. Again, hit pause, rewind as necessary, email me as a last resort. Now, as you hover your cursor over an object that is selected, around the edges, you'll, your cursor will turn into kind of this double arrow, this up and down arrow. And that allows you to click and rotate. And shortcut keys are your friend. If I hold down shift at this point, I can now lock this to 90 degrees. And I want that to be just like that. Why am I doing this? Well, I want this shape and this shape. I'm holding down shift to select those. And I lost my align toolbar. No, it's here somewhere. There it is. I'm going to revisit the align tool. And I want to align to selection. That is good. Align these left, align these top. That gives me this shape here. Now I'll select those. And I'll use this first Boolean tool, which is Unite. Click that. And it now creates and turns those into one shape, which is very convenient. Hold down Shift. Hover over the corner until you see that little rotate icon. Turn this 90 degrees. Of course, this only works if north is, in fact, up. Now, select tool. Click here. Hold down Shift. Click here. And I will now go to Align. And boom. Now I'll just use my arrow keys. So I'm highlighting that just clicking my arrow key a bunch of time. If you hold on shift and hit your arrow key, it moves it a little bit more. That looks pretty good. Now the fun part, select both of those and hit this first one minus front. It just punches that top one through to the bottom. Fun stuff. Now, you know what, let's put a little N in there. N. Make it bigger. I'll just kind of eye this time. And I'll make it white. So here's something that's kind of fun too. You can right click over any text and select create outlines. And it does just that. It is no longer an editable piece of text, but now it is a shape. That works really well. How about for a matte tangent moment? Because I haven't had one of those in a while. You know, when you're creating logos, Let's let's get rid of that. Let's do uh, let's do an M 
and I'm going to right click create outlines you do not need to do this for this assignment I just decided I want a logo so I'm going to click those drag this over here and and how about let's let's put a uh, let's mix a serif and a sans serif font right click create outlines take this shape let's let's do some gestalt psychology principles here highlight punch there you go there's my new logo for i don't know matt chambers video creation backing up end of tangent moment just wanted to show you that we've got to this shape here i have converted this to a smart object now when you create some of these shapes sometimes they automatically create a group you might say well no that's cool i want to punch this end through here you can't quite punch it through effectively until you explode this kind of circle shape that we created so i will right click or ungroup i guess that gives me this piece and this piece got to be careful because now they're independent of one another but now i can highlight the n and that shape and do that punch through and I'll probably want to create a group again just to keep these kind of close by. Why would I want to do that? Well, now you can kind of do some fun stuff like making this white and then putting it over your image. Whoops, why is that? Oh, I know why. Because it is in layer one. I need to move my aerial photo below layer one. There you go. So maybe I want this to go in the corner like that. But actually I don't, I want that to go over here to kind of fill out the space. There we go, that looks pretty good. And you know what? I just thought of another Matt tangent moment. I'm sorry, I gotta, can't pass this up because it's too good. I'm going to make a few copies of this. Pretend these are trees. You'll see this later on in another video, but let's say you're just doing a little shotgun style planting plan here. And you don't want all of these to be exactly the same. Well, we spent some time up here, object transform. There is an option up here, transform each. Really cool, really powerful tool that I guarantee you will use and use often. If these were trees, you know, they would vary probably between 90 and 110%, even if they're all the exact same tree. Moving, I won't worry about. Rotating, well, depending on how these are drawn, I'll say 360. I'm gonna randomize these guys all into 360. We'll do random, hit preview, and look at that. They all change around in different weird shapes. Horizontal, vertical, oh. If I wanted to lock the X and Y, I thought there was a way to do it up here, but maybe not. Anyhow, kind of a neat thing. You may or may not use it. Probably not for this assignment. Now we are really close to being done. We've got our scale, we've got some details. I want to wireframe or block out. This is just generally a good thing to do, especially when you're first laying these out. I'd probably want to use part of this space for a description and then part of this space for a legend. And this is where this smart guides really come in handy and are helpful. I'll drag that handle over, maybe move both of these up. And part of the key to doing this and not being too jarring, if you were just to save this, that's almost too jarring. Or if you were working with a group and, and they saw this. So I'll select both of those blocks and just give them a, a light gray for now. Then I may also want to pop some text in here. This is just kind of a, whoops, I don't want to move that. Kind of a personal thing, you don't have to do this, but I, I like to put notes at an angle. And I'm going to copy and paste that with my shortcut. Control V, Control C. So kind of a nice convention, just whenever I have something that's more of a note rather than a real thing, 
I tend to put it at an angle. And I'm going to make those also a light gray. Whoops, that's a little too light because I still want to read them. OK, so pretty darn close. I just need to clean these up, match. You know, There's not really a hard and set rule to do this. Just do something that makes sense. So if you were to pass this off to anyone, they wouldn't need to think too hard about it. I've got my aerial photo. What are some other ones I need? Legend scale it's here. Scale legend. As long as these don't overlap, you don't need to worry about what order they are in. Well, let's call some details. And how do I get these into the correct location? I highlight them and drag the little square over here. There are other ways. This is the easiest. And you know, now that I look at this, I think this could probably work pretty well right here, too. It's a little bit opposite of how I did my example over here. My, my graphic scale got kind of flopped. So that looks pretty good. Highlight that and drag it up to scale. Spacebar will bring up your pan tool. Maybe I should have mentioned that a while ago. Holding down shift to do a multiple select, and I'll put those under legend. And now I don't need this. There is one final, final thing. Well, actually a few final things. One final illustrator thing, and that is to provide proper citation. I always think about whenever you're using something that you did not create, how does it need to be cited? Don't go off of what another instructor tells you to do. Go to the source. I guess you can do that when in doubt, but if you dig a little bit, for example, in the USGS site, you will find out all you need to do is include this little piece of line here, data available from the USGS Geological Survey. Google Earth wants you to include this little thing down here. Bing, they're doing something weird starting in 2014. I'm not even quite sure, but just find out from the source how they like to have their stuff cited. I'll just copy that text, go back to Illustrator, text tool, I'll click up here. And you know what, I could put this up here, I could put it down here. I'm gonna go ahead and rotate this, make it white. And I'm even going to bring up my appearance because I don't want it to be too jarring. And I'll just put my opacity down to 50%. It's still very visible. It's still good karma. There you go. And maybe I'll tweak this a little bit. I'll grab those, nudge those down. My arrow keys, hit this one. I need to put that. Oh, it's already in the aerial photo layer. That is good. All right. Oh, and you know what? You probably want to save this. Save it early, save it often. I probably went way too long than I should have. But all of this is now contained in this folder. It's got my link, my one link, and my one file. If I were to get an info on that, I can see that it's 8.6 megabytes. That is surprisingly large. It's much larger. I think it might be because maybe something has changed. Illustrator used to, by default, link files, but that to me sure seems like it is embedded. Well, we won't worry about it right now. All right, this part is done. We need to save this to a very print friendly file size and quality PDF. You do that from a save as, not an export. An export will take you to an image or an AutoCAD file or something else. And when in doubt, just open these up. And if you don't see what you're looking for in this list here, it's probably somewhere else. In this example, we want to do a save as because Adobe pioneered the PDF format. It's fairly universal, but they invented it. So this is under a save as option. I will select PDF and you can give it the same name. That is perfectly fine. I'm in the same folder here. I'll fix that in a moment. That's okay. 
Super duper important. The preset you want to select is high quality print and you want to deselect that top option. That will make your file size way bigger than what it needs to be. The preserve illustrator editing capabilities means it is embedding the illustrator file in the PDF. When you want to do that is when you want people without illustrator to be able to view this in a standard PDF browser. I've got preview here. You can also use Adobe Acrobat. That is probably much more common. A lot of web browsers will also render a PDF, but you can also open it up in illustrator and it, retains all of this good stuff here, the layer organization, your text styles, your paragraph styles, etc. So it's kind of the best of both worlds. The downside is the file becomes very large. So short story, unselect that. Hit save PDF. Navigate to where it is saved. Maybe do a little inspection. So this is one megabyte in file size. Very good quality, very nice print. I can send it to the printer and it would be really good. Here's the one uh, thing that you would need to change that I kind of got out of sync on is I want this to be outside of the folder for my students who are submitting this. And I want your other files to be inside of another folder. I'll call it Illustrator. Now remember, this is saved. Those files just need to be relative to one another at all times because these two are in the same folder, Met Project. I can move those together and put them in here. They are now still in the same folder. That relative relationship is really important. If I move that after the fact, let's say you got this far and you just realize, oh crud, I, this was sitting on my desktop the whole time and I better put them in the same folder because that's what Matt said. When I try to open this, it's not going to find that link. It may, but it, it's going to give me a little headache, and that's no good. When you are this far, all you need to do is highlight those, right-click, and on Windows, you will want to select Send to Compressed Folder. On a Mac, it's called Compressed, and that creates a nice little zipped package. That is all you need to upload. So there you go, the entire project in one convenient video, and my students have a week to watch and learn and figure this out. We'll be doing the same thing in class. If you have any questions, shoot me an email or ask at any time. Thank you and good luck.